What is up everyone, my name is Joseph and welcome back to Casual Competitive MTG. For this video, we're going to do something a little bit different. I actually met up with some other content creators to play and record some games, and I figured since I wasn't with my normal group, it'd be interesting to give you guys kind of a first person perspective of this game from my point of view. It still will be narrated and you'll still get the play by play of every play, but it'll just have some added commentary and justification for my thought process and plays. If you do like this style of content, I highly suggest checking out a YouTube channel called Comedian. He does very similar content on a much more frequent basis, and it's really interesting and entertaining to see someone playing CEDH and knowing their justifications and really getting the reasoning behind their play. I found it's made me a better player, and I think it'll help you guys out as well. That being said, the players that we're playing with today are Ryan from Playing With Power, Elliot from The Spike Feeders, and Cam from Play To Win. So hopefully, you're excited for that. Before we get into the gameplay, let's go over some quick channel promotions. If you like the channel and want to help support what we do, we have a Patreon link in the description and some reward tiers that we think you'll really enjoy if you're interested in that. If you want to rep some casual competitive merch, we have a link to our merch store in the description as well. If you're planning on buying cards in the near future, if you click on our TCG affiliate link in the description, any purchase you make after clicking on that link will directly help out the channel at no cost to you. And finally, if you're looking to pick up some more Magic the Gathering items or cards, we're affiliated with Flipside Gaming, where if you use our code CASUALLYMTG at checkout, not only will you get a 10% discount on eligible purchases, but you'll also help out the channel. Now with that out of the way, let's get into the deck introductions for this content creator mashup. So for this game we had a theme, and the theme was just off meta, and that's not really much of a description, but just in general, we wanted just to stay away from the top tier decks and just explore that higher powered, low side of CEDH a little bit more. So that being said, Ryan from Playing With Power went first in this game, playing Esper Stacks, led by Alayla Artful Provocateur. This deck looks to capitalize on stopping what a lot of common win cons are, eventually just grinding the game to a halt and realistically just winning through beats with Elish Norn or just through the fairies created through Alayla's ability. Cam from Play to Win went second playing a colorless deck led by Kozilek, the Great Distortion. This deck was actually played in one of their recent videos, so if you want to see more of this deck, I'll leave a link for it in the upper right hand corner of this video. But just to summarize, this deck looks to win through artifact based combos and damn there are a lot of them in here. Going third in this game is Elliot from the Spike Feeders playing Croxa, Titan of Death's Hunger. This deck looks to just grind down people's hands using cards like Reanimation Effects on Sire of Insanity, Siphon Mind, Croxa's own ability, and then cards to capitalize on this like Waste Knot. This deck features a World Gorger Dragon line that allows him to generate infinite mana and then cast Croxa as many times as he needs in order to win the game. So going into this pod, I actually wasn't too concerned with stacks or just discard based cards because I felt like I could get ahead of it more than some of my opponents could. So even though Croxa is built around being hellbent, I think I can cope with it a little bit more than the other two, for example. So playing against stacks, specifically as Edric, I felt like I was in a decent position, so I was feeling pretty good. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, I was going last, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. I was playing Edric, Spy Master of Trust, and the goal of this deck is to play evasive creatures, play Edric, and just draw a lot of cards, eventually winning by playing Nexus of Fate, shuffling it back into an empty library after I've drawn my entire deck, and then drawing it for turn, casting it again, drawing it for turn, and since Edric's ability is a May, I never deck myself, so I just take infinite turns and eventually get damage through, and that's how I win the game. But to start the game, I need to set up a board of things that can attack, and when I'm going last, it means by the time that I'll have something that can swing, everyone's already established a board of two full turns by the time I get to my second turn. So because of that, I kept an opening hand that was a little bit safer and a little bit more controlly. My opening hand was a Prismatic Vista, a Mental Misstep, a Wing Crafter, a Slither Blade, a Sylvan Library, a Snapcaster Mage, and a Mana Drain. Now I know this only has one land, but my thought process was, at least if I can drop the Sylvan Library turn two, I do have a Mental Misstep for control, and worst case, I have a Mana Drain for later on with a Snapcaster to recur it when I need it. So I felt like given the circumstances, this was probably a decent opening hand to keep, a little bit on the safer side and slower side, with one land also a riskier side, but it had a lot of control in it, it had unblockable creatures, and it had a draw engine, so although I didn't have any ramp, as long as I drew a land in the first or second turn, I felt like I could make something with this hand, and I felt like the control pieces I was keeping was enough to get me into that mid game where this deck will really shine. That being said, that was why I kept this hand, let's get into the actual game. 
So Elliot started off with a Gemstone Caverns pregame action, and then Ryan went into his first turn, playing an Island, a turn one Soul Ring, and he turned that Soul Ring into a turn one Torpor Orb, which I was actually really excited about because that hits very few things in my deck and really stops specifically Croxa, which I was kind of excited about because I am a little worried about getting my hand grinded down a little bit too early. So with that, he passed the turn to Cam, and Cam starts his turn by playing a Sanctum of Ugin and then tries to cast a Mana Vault, and that mental misstep in my hand was just calling my name, so I paid two life to counter it. The reason was, if I can keep a colorless deck off of their main mana source, that's going to be huge for me, and giving him three mana of his primary color just seemed like a good, valuable counter, so I decided to do that. Cam continues his turn with an Urza's Bauble, and then he immediately cracks it to look at one card in Elliot's hand. He then passes the turn and draws on Elliot's upkeep, and Elliot's turn consisted of playing a Swamp and then casting a Faithless Looting, drawing two cards and then discarding a Blood Moon and a Sire of Insanity. Thankfully, he passes the turn and doesn't cast Reanimate, because that would have made my mental misstep counter look really bad. Uh, so anyway, I go to my turn, play my Prismatic Vista, crack it for an island, and then play my draw, which was a Soul Ring, which was a little risky because if I don't draw a green source, it does keep me off of Sylvan Library, but I felt like I did start needing to generate some blue mana for the control pieces in my hand, so I went with an island, Soul Ring, and then passed. Ryan plays a Misty Rainforest, cracks it for a Tundra, and then casts a Draineth Magistrate, which made me sad and happy at the same time. Happy because this further shuts down Croxa, sad because Edric is all about playing tiny creatures that do nothing without Edric. Unfortunately, there was nothing I could do about it, so Ryan passes the Cam, Cam plays a land, and then passes. Elliot plays a Marsh Flats, cracks it for a Badlands, and then casts a Mana Vault, and he then uses the Mana Vault to cast a By Force X equaling 3, targeting both Soul Rings and the Torpor Orb, which made me sad, but the Draineth Magistrate now looks a lot better because that at least stops him from that win con now that the Torpor Orb is gone. That's all he does on his turn, passes to me, I draw, play a Flooded Strand because I'm never punished for keeping one land, and then I crack it for a Breeding Pool, and I then played myself in Library, so the Soul Ring getting removed was bad, but at least I have some type of draw engine on the board, and I leave no mana up here, but I'm hoping the stacks decks at the table just continue to stacks and grind the game out, because honestly that kind of works for me in this situation. So I pass to Ryan, Ryan goes immediately to combat, swings one at Elliot, passes to Cam, Cam plays a land and passes, Elliot takes one from his Mana Vault in his draw step, plays a Swamp, and then taps his mana to cast an Anime Dead on Sire of Insanity. Now, weirdly enough, I'm super okay with this because I think with the Sylvan Library, I can kind of get more advantage and value than most people can because I'll be able to play out my hand consistently, and I'm drawing two extra cards, which is more than everyone else, so I'm actually okay with it. I couldn't have stopped it anyway, but it would have worked in my favor. Unfortunately, Ryan decides to Cyclonic Rift the Sire of Insanity before Elliot moves to his end step. I go to my turn, I draw three cards, I pay eight life to keep all of them going down to 26, and then I play a Misty Rainforest as my land. Again, not being punished for this one land keep, and I then play a Slither Blade and pass. Ryan goes to combat again on his turn, swings one at Elliot, and passes to Cam. Cam plays a Mage Ring Network, taps his mana for a Joyra's Familiar, and then casts a Sensei's Divining Top, which actually made me pause for a second because I could stop it if I wanted to, and I know there's a lot of ways to combo with a free Sensei's Divining Top since it's reduced by one, and I really was a little nervous of it, but it didn't seem like a good enough mana drain target, and I figured if something was going to happen, I can probably stop it at that point. I'd rather hold up the mana drain, especially with Draineth Magistrate turning off my Snapcaster. I figured I'd just let it go through. So it goes through, he passes to Elliot, Elliot takes a damage from Vault, casts a Tormenting Voice, uh, discarding Sire of Insanity as an additional cost, and he then casts Dance of the Dead. Now at this point, now that my opponent has at least a card selection engine with Sensei's Divining Top, I'm a little less confident about the Sire of Insanity, so I decide to crack my Misty Rainforest for an island, and then I cast my Mana Drain countering the spell, which is really unfortunate because I have nothing in my hand to capitalize off of this mana, but if I'm not getting the second most value off of this Sire, I don't want it on the battlefield, and since there is a Divining Top and a ton of ramp on Cam's board, I feel like I have to stop the Sire at this point. So I do go to my turn. I do not take any life off of my Sylvan Library because I'm getting a little low and I'm a little nervous about what's going to be reanimated and swinging at me. So I don't take any life, add three colorless mana, play a Sylvan Safekeeper, and do nothing with this mana. Pass the turn, making my mana drain incredibly useless. Ryan goes to combat again, swings at Elliot for one, and then casts a rest in peace, really just ruining Elliot's life at this point, which is fine by me because at this point I can't really stop too much else with the mana drain gone. 
So he casts that, passes to Cam. Cam plays an Arch of Orozka and a Clock of Omens, just establishing his board state, and then passes to Elliot. Elliot decides to actually take his turn off to untap Mana Vault, and then he plays an Ancient Tomb and passes to me. And on his end step, I decide to just flash out Snapcaster Mage, because I think at this point, I really just need to start getting a little bit more damage through, and I wouldn't even remove that Rest in Peace if I could. So removing it and also putting stuff in my graveyard, that's just too many pieces for Snapcaster Mage, so I just cast it for another body. I then go to my turn. I take four damage this time from my Sylvan Library to keep one extra card. I then play my land for turn, swing three damage at Elliot, and then pass to Ryan. Ryan again misses his land drop, swings one at Elliot, and then passes to Cam, and Cam activates his Divining Top on Ryan's end step, rearranging the top three. Cam then goes to his turn, gains a life from his Inventor's Fair, plays a Sequestered Stash, swings 2 damage at Ryan, and then attempts to cast a Worm Coil Engine. Now, I can't let this resolve because my life total at this point is 21, and there's no better target to swing at other than me since I can't block that and kill it anyway, so I counter it with Unified Will. Cam then passes to Elliot. Elliot plays a Prismatic Vista, cracks it for a Swamp, and then passes to me. I decide to take 8 damage this time with my Sylvan Library and go down to 13. I play an island as my land and then I play a Dryad of the Elysian Grove and I follow that up by casting a Wing Crafter and I decide to pair it with the Dryad rather than waiting for Edric because of the Draineth Magistrate and I just think having a 2-4 body in the air is going to come in handy later on. And just to give you guys a heads up, my game plan here is just survive until someone deals with Draineth because I am really not drawing anything worthwhile at this point. I then swing 4 damage at Elliot and with that all done I pass to Ryan. Ryan decides to keep his blocker up this time and then just immediately passes and on his end step, Cam spins his top again, rearranging the top three. Cam then goes to his turn, gains a life from Inventor's Fair, and then casts Karn Scion of Urza. He takes it up, reveals a Crucible of Worlds and a Homeward Path, targets Elliot. Elliot gives him the Crucible of Worlds, which in this situation, <laughs> not a good card to say the least. He then swings his familiar at me, not remembering that I just gave my Dryad flying and immediately making my decision worthwhile. So I block with the Dryad, kill his creature, and then in his second main phase, he casts Crucible of Worlds, just I assume for the artifact and the Clock of Omens at this point. And he then plays his land for turn, a Tabernacle of Pendril Veil. Now I've never actually played against this card, and I feel like the deck I'm playing is really bad against Tabernacle, so that's not really great for me at this point, but Cam just passes to Elliot. Elliot draws and becomes my favorite person at this table by casting a Wheel of Fortune. Now Ryan obviously kept a greedy opening hand with very few lands, and he hasn't probably been able to do what he wanted to based on his board state, so him discarding the cards he has left is so good for me, even though it's giving everyone card advantage. So I pass priority on wheel, Ryan swords to plowshares my dryad, which is pretty fair because I'm drawing 7 cards, I'd probably have 2 lands in the next turn, but I gain 2 life, which is actually not irrelevant with how much I'm just absolutely tanking my life total on my own. This brings me up to 15, and let me remind you, no one has done damage to me except for me. But anyway, the wheel resolves. I discard a Pact of Negation, a Walk the Aeons, and an Eternal Witness, which are pretty dead cards at this point. Uh, but Ryan discards a Toxic Deluge, a Trinisphere, an Ashiok Dream Render, a Ristic Study, a Timna, and an Eidolon of Rhetoric. So overall, I think this wheel was a net positive for me, even though it gave my opponents a lot of cards that they didn't have before. It got rid of some dead cards in my hand and got rid of some really good cards from Ryan. So Elliot finishes his turn by playing a Scalding Katarn and cracking up her mountain and then casting a Soul Ring. I go to my turn, in my upkeep, pay for my three creatures due to the tabernacle trigger. I decide to sacrifice Snapcaster since it's not doing much. I keep one card off of Sylvan Library, taking no life. I play a Forest as my land, and then I cast a Collector Oof. I didn't really think I'd get too much value off of the Oof because it's going to be a high priority kill target because of the artifact based deck and the Rakdos deck that ramps with artifacts, but I thought maybe adding in a little extra stacks would stall this game out a little bit more, and I needed the stalling. So I pass to Ryan. Ryan pays for his Magistrate off of the Tabernacle Trigger, plays a Sarah Sanctum as his land, and then casts a Spirit of the Labyrinth. Which is super unfortunate because now even if Draneth Magistrate leaves, Edric does nothing if I can only draw one card per turn. But he passes to Cam. Cam gains life from Inventor's Fair, takes up Karn, this time flipping a Urza's Power Plant and a Kark Clan Ironwork. Elliot gives him the land, and Cam then plays that land for his turn, and he then casts an Aetherflux Reservoir. I can't do anything about this, and it's really bad because my plan of just slowly whittling people away is going to be completely counteracted by him just gaining massive life. But with no way to stop it, I pass priority, and then Ryan saves the day with a Force of Negation, countering the Aetherflux. 
Cam then plays a Mox Opal and then a Graph Digger's Cage, really just cementing in the fact that Elliot's probably not going to play this game, and he then passes to Elliot. Elliot draws and plays what I think he drew that turn, which is a Toxic Deluge, paying three life into the spell, wiping the board, which is actually insane for me because it turns my entire deck online while keeping his offline due to the Rest in Peace and the Graph Digger's Cage. So I'm really happy about this. It resolves, and Elliot then attempts to Chaos Warp the Rest in Peace. I counter this with a Dispel because now that the creatures are gone and my game plan's back online, I still want to make sure that this Rest in Peace sticks around because it doesn't affect me, but it does affect Elliot. So my Dispel resolves, I go to my turn, I pay no life due to the Sylvan Library, I play a Polluted Delta as my land, I play a Mana Crypt now that it's online, and then I cast Edric floating a Colorless Mana, crack my Polluted Delta going to 14 for an Island, and then I cast Karn's Temporal Sundering. It resolves, and I bounce my own Mana Crypt to my hand because I cannot let that stay on my board for very long or I will die to it, especially with my game plan being infinite turns. So I then pass the turn to myself, pay for Edric in my upkeep, take no additional cards from Sylvan Library, and then I cast a Rhystic Study. I go to combat, I swing two at Ryan, I draw a card off of Edric, and in my second main phase, I cast Tetsuko, Umazawa, Fugitive, just starting to build this board back up of these evasive creatures. Then I pass to Ryan. Ryan plays a land and attempts to cast a Winter Orb, paying for Rhystic Study, and I realistically can't let this resolve if I want to win the game because it's really hard to cast spells every turn if I'm untapping one land, so I cast Fierce Guardianship, my counter resolves, his spell is countered, and he passes to Cam. Cam gains another life from Inventor's Fair, plays a Buried Ruins, minus his Karn to put his KCI to his hand, and then he casts KCI, paying for Rhystic Study. He then taps two artifacts to untap his Mox Opal, and he then does that again for two mana, and he then cracks his Crystal Vein, all to help cast Spine of Ishnot. He does not pay for Rhystic, but he does target Rhystic when it enters the battlefield, so I lose my Rhystic study. Cam passes to Elliot, and Elliot at this point has used a lot of removal to try to get back into this game, but unfortunately has nothing left for this turn. Passes to me. I, in my upkeep, pay two for Tabernacle to keep my creatures around, pay no additional life to Sylvan Library, play an island as my land, cast a Carpet of Flowers, and then swing three total damage at Orion, draw two off of the two creatures doing combat damage, and in my second main phase, I make two mana off of Carpet of Flowers targeting Ryan, and I tap the rest of my mana, attempting to cast Nexus of Fate. Now I know I have no mana up, and obviously the pact is not in my hand, but I did feel like I just had to kind of force something at this point, because I needed advantage. Unfortunately, Elliot had the answer and cast a Red Elemental Blast, countering my spell. However, this isn't a full loss for me, because my Nexus of Fate still shuffles back into my library due to how Nexus of Fate and Rest in Peace interact. Since they're both replacement effects, I can choose the Nexus of Fate replacement effect first and shuffle it back in. I then, with no mana, pass to Ryan. Ryan plays an untapped Godless Shrine and then casts a Smothering Tithe, and follows that up by casting a Luminarch Ascension. With nothing left, he gives the turn to Cam. Cam gains another life off of Inventor's Fair, draws a card, pays for Tithe, and then plays a Mistress Factory as his land. He then casts a Workshop Assistant. He then ticks down Karn to create a 9-9 Construct. And at this point, I'm actually really excited about the Luminarch Ascension, because if not, that Construct's coming from me. So now that there's another valid target to swing at, I feel a little bit more safe about the board states. Cam then finishes his turn, passes to Elliot, Elliot draws, pays for Tithe, plays his land, and with nothing left, passes to me, and Luminarch's Ascension gets a second counter. I go to my turn, I pay for both my creatures from Tabernacle, I draw my card for turn, and do not draw from Sylvan Library, so I only draw one, and I pay for Smothering Tithe with that one draw. I then swing three at Ryan, draw two cards, pay for one of the Tithe triggers, giving Ryan a treasure, but drawing those two cards still. I then play a Waterlogged Grove, cast a Finthorn Elves, and pass to Ryan. Ryan plays a Strip Mine, then follows us up with a Linvala Keeper of Silence, which normally I'm scared of, but right now I'm not because he is a prime swing target with that Luminarch's Ascension. And he then passes the turn, and Cam activates top on his end step, and puts a Storage Counter on the Mage Ring Network. On his turn, Cam pays for his creatures from the Tabernacle Trigger, draws and pays for the Tithe Trigger, casts an Ikor Wellsprings, drawing when it enters the battlefield, and paying for this Tithe Trigger as well, and he then does some shenanigans by tapping artifacts to untap his Mox Opal with Clock of Omens to cast a Thran Dynamo. He then swings his now 10 tank construct at Orion, Orion chumps with Linvala, and in his second main phase, Cam uses the minus 2 ability on Karn to create another construct. He then passes to Elliot, Ascension gets its third trigger, and Elliot then goes to his turn, draws, pays for Tithe, 
and then casts Croxa. Now it's at this point I realize Ryan has no cards in hand. Now playing over webcam, it's a little bit hard to keep track of that, but knowing this makes my hand look a lot better because I know that Ryan won't be able to stop anything I have. That being said, Ryan can't discard, takes three damage, so the Luminarch Ascension does not trigger, which again, is very relevant. With nothing left, Elliot passes to me, and I go to my turn. In my upkeep, I pay for all three creatures, draw one card for turn, do not pay for tithe. I then go to combat, swing four damage at Ryan, draw three cards, this time not paying for tithe. And in my second main phase, with my Carpet of Flowers, I make two blue mana. I then play a forest, and I then cast Beacon of Tomorrows. Now I had this card in my hand at the start of the turn, and knowing that Ryan had no cards in hand, I was pretty confident that this would resolve, and I was hoping I could make something out of it. Luckily, my draws from Edric were very good. So I finished my turn by casting a Boreal Druid, taking one damage from Waterlogged Grove, going down to 13, and then I go to my next turn. In my upkeep, I pay for all of my creatures. I draw three from Sylvan Library, not paying for Smothering Tithe, and keeping all three going down to five life. At this point, my mindset is I either win here or I die on the next turn cycle, so I have to just go for it. Now, one of the draws from Edric was an extra turn spell, so that gave me the confidence to be a little bit greedy. Luckily, one of these three draws from Sylvan Library was a Druid's Repository, so I played that in my first main phase, and at this point, I'm feeling pretty good. As long as I can continually draw a decent amount of cards, there's a high probability I continue to draw extra turn spells, and the Druid's Repository helps me break parity with Tabernacle of Pendril Veil. Vale. So I then go to combat, swing 5 damage at Ryan, draw 4 cards, not paying for any, and putting 4 counters on Druid's Repository. And in my second main phase, I had 2 blue mana from Carpet of Flowers, and then cast the extra turn spell I had previously, which was Notorious Throng, which is probably the reason I felt so confident. It resolves. I make five 1-1 one, one fairy creatures from the five damage I dealt. I finish this turn by casting a Draga Tree Speaker with my Waterlogged Grove going down to four. And then I discard down to hand size and go to my third turn this turn cycle. In my upkeep, I pay to keep all of my creatures around. I draw three from Sylvan Library, but only keep one. And at this point, I'm not paying for any tithe triggers because I figure either I win here or I lose when I pass turn. So I don't pay for any tithe triggers after this point. So I go to combat, I swing 2 damage at Ryan, 9 at Elliot, and draw a total of 10 cards, getting 10 Druid's Repository triggers. Now one thing to keep in mind is that I can't kill Ryan first because I am a little scared of what Elliot can do. If he has a way to discard a World Gorger Dragon, for example, and then reanimate it with Necromancy, he could still create infinite mana, so if that rest in peace is gone, I could be in trouble. So at this point, I kind of shift focus to trying to kill Elliot first before I take care of Ryan. That's just a minor thing, but it is something that was going through my head. I know Crocs has instant speed wins, and I didn't want to risk it. In my second main phase, I make two green with my Carpet of Flowers, cast Azusa Lost But Seeking, play three lands for turn, one of which was a Nykthos. I then activate Nykthos for nine green mana and use some of this to cast Nexus of Fate, use some more of it to cast Eladomri, Lord of Leaves. I then follow that up with a Temporal Manipulation and two more invasive creatures. On my end step, Ryan strip mines my Nykthos, but at this point it doesn't really matter too much with the Druid's Repository and the amount of creatures I have. I can pretty much get there. So I go to my next turn, I pay for all my creatures, and I then go to combat, swinging enough damage at Elliot to take him out of the game, swinging some at Ryan, drawing all the cards, adding on the counters, and at this point I let the table know that unless there's interaction, I have three extra turn spells in my hand and the mana to cast multiple of them. So unless they can stop it, I will draw my library on my next turn, which means I can just start looping Nexus of Fate. Ryan says he has nothing. Cam, when he gets priority, activates his Sensei's Divining Top and then states that he also does not have interaction. So I end up winning the game. Now this game may have looked like just a giant Stax Fest, but honestly, it was a lot of fun to play. I really enjoy playing against Stax decks because it makes you think just extra hard about how to get to your win condition or how to get to where you need to go. For example, in this game, I needed my Edric back online, but at the same time, I didn't want to enable the other decks at the table. So there's always a toss up and there's always a balance there on actually removing those Stax pieces. And I really enjoy that type of gameplay. That being said, hopefully you guys did enjoy this video. That is all we have for this one, but maybe there might be more in the future. Let us know what you think about this format and this style. They are a little bit easier to produce, and it might be an interesting thing to do moving forward on occasion. But with all that said, thank you guys so much for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed it. I am Joseph, this is Casually Competitive MTG, and we will see you next time.